For more debates, updates, and bonus clips, sign up at thebigconversation.show. It is an extraordinary organ, isn't it, the brain? And it when is. you consider that, on a naturalist perspective even, uh, inanimate atoms have come to reflect upon themselves, it, it, it is an extraordinary thing, it consciousness. It absolutely is. Uh, in that sense, do you do you feel that there's still an element of mystery there, or are you happy to say no? I think we really can. Ultimately. I think we really can. It's a puzzle. Yeah, and and it's what I call the hard question, not the mm. hard problem, but the hard question. The hard question is, and then what happens? That is, all right. You've got this analysis of information coming in from the senses, for instance, and then what happens? There's a whole story to be told about how we use it, how it modifies our beliefs and our emotions and our memories and our personalities and what we say next and what our projects are. And mostly, even scientists have sort of stopped when they've stopped at consciousness as if that was the finish line. Mm. No, no, that's not the finish line. That's, all, that's only halfway through. And we have to do, and then what happens? And only when we can explain how consciousness not only moves our bodies and gets our lips moving and so forth, mm, mm. but feeds back on itself and permits us to reflect and reflect and reflect and reflect and reflect. And it's only when you've got an account of the actual brain mechanisms that make this incredible reflective capacity available, then you're really beginning to explain okay. consciousness. Keith, as an idealist then, what's your problem with this particular account of the way that the material brain can quite satisfactorily account for all of our conscious states yeah. and, and that sort of thing? Well, first of all, to begin with, I absolutely think it's important to take scientific knowledge about the brain and about the world seriously, and I do want to do that. Um, I don't want to uh, include that in some preordained idealist picture, um, but I want to understand how it is that the physical structures of the brain interact with consciousness. Having said that, um, uh, I don't either think that we have infallible uh, knowledge of what's going on in our mind's consciousness, and I agree that um, a lot of what we're conscious of is caused by um, the brain, and if, if something's wrong with your brain, then typically uh, something is wrong with uh, what you understand your consciousness to be. Uh, so it's not an infallible uh, thing, consciousness, mm. but I think it is a thing in the broadest sense. That is to say, if you made a, a, a list of the items that exist in the universe, and you had electrons and quarks and superstrings and whatever, and brains, of course, you would also have to add, and consciousness, because I don't really, I'm not convinced that uh, a study of the brain will ever answer the question how consciousness originates. I don't see how that could be done because uh, um, you could say, well, when a, the brain, when a, a brain of some sort is in a certain configuration, then consciousness occurs. But that seems to me to be a causal relationship which is contingent. It could have been different. You know, people Just explain that a bit more. What, what, what's the problem with the idea of consciousness arising by a particular, you know, combination of neurochemicals? Well, and because so a combination on. of neurons and chemicals is exactly that. And you could know all about that and not know about there being any consciousness. I mean, we, we take an example uh, which appeals to me about an ant, right? Think of an ant and say, is an ant conscious? Well, I really think we don't know. I don't think ants are conscious personally, but I really don't know. But I, if I ask that question, I'm asking whether there is something about an ant that physical inspection cannot decide. Right? Mm. So I don't think any physical inspection of an ant will tell you whether it's conscious. 